Thank you all for coming. Really, it's uh, uh, delightful to see all of you turning out. So I'm curious. So I'm Stephen Bizruchka. I'm a, uh, I teach in the School of Public Health in the University of Washington. Uh, I have worked clinically as a doctor since 1973, and I've spent about 10 years in Nepal, uh, including writing the first trekking guidebook to the country. Uh, setting up a community health project a week's walk from the road, uh, setting up a remote district hospital as a teaching hospital for Nepali doctors, and a bunch of activities like that. Uh, all, of these, uh, all of these experiences has really um, affected my perspective on what I want to talk about tonight. And um, so I came here to UW in 1994 to the School of Public Health, and I've uh, sort of been a faculty person uh, ever since. I, uh, so that's, a, that's enough about me, and uh, I want to thank you for coming. And I want to ask you, why do people come to book readings? Why do you come here? Now, I see a few of my students. I told them they'd get extra credit if they came here. <laughs> so <laughs> I know why they're here. Um, but why do other people come? Well, I read this book. OK, that's my wife's book there. <laughs> Beyond the Next Village, about uh, being a health worker in Nepal in the early 70s. And I read the Oh, well, thank you very much. So my wife, Marianne Mercer, uh, I met when I went back to public health school in 1992, and uh, uh, she was my teacher then. So I met and married my teacher after leaving. Uh, she's always clear to state it was about two years later after I left before we got together. Um, other reasons for coming besides getting extra credit? Well, wow. inspiration. Okay, please. Um, you'll tell us a backstory. To you, you will tell us a backstory. A fact story. Fact. 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 The story behind the story. The story behind the story. Okay. So I asked myself the same question: Why do I go to book readings? And. Uh, one of the reasons is to see who this person who is talking about these ideas that I'm interested in is like and um, you know, get to know them. And so I have to say, for a lot of the ideas that, I, that are in the book, I tried to find the primary sources of those ideas and uh, do something like spend a month with them in Nepal walking or meeting them at conferences or uh, if somebody had died, meeting somebody who had spent considerable time with them. So that's an opportunity to get a gauge of the person that is presenting these ideas. Um, so what is, you know, what am I like? Well, <laughs> as a child, it's kind of interesting. I, my father repaired shoes and my mother was a, was a mother and we lived above the shoe store. And so I came from a working class background. And for reasons that I can't understand, I had a, one of two goals as a child. I either wanted to cure cancer or harness fusion, the energy in the sun. And uh, so what happened? Well, I got cancer, and the, uh, the fusion situation is uh, well, made some progress, perhaps, but, uh, but not enough. So any other thoughts on uh, attending a book reading? I like to support authors who work hard uh, to write a book. And the snob in me likes to be able to drop the name of uh, <laughs> okay. So support authors who, who wrote a book. So um, the title of the book is Inequality Kills Us All, COVID-19's Health Lessons for the World. What does that mean to you? You know, I, I tell my students that whatever you put, when you put a title on something, it should, it should say everything uh, that's inside or, uh, and make them want to read it. 
<laughs> that's you're working on this for your life. Or? That's probably true. I started working on this in 1996, and um, and COVID helped it along because. So, what are the COVID health lessons? Well, I'll get into that a little bit. But the first, you know, the the big white letters, inequality kills us all. Does anybody here believe this? Yeah. So think of, so, yeah, I mean, some explanations. Why do you, how do you think inequality kills us? Is it, uh, you know, somebody with a, uh, a mass shooter comes in and, uh, and, and, and it suddenly happens? Believe it or not, uh, the Secret Service came out with a report last month, sorry, January, on reasons for mass shootings. There are now many studies showing that income inequality within the United States is linked to mass shootings and that the really sensitive places where it's more likely to happen are those where there's a big gap between the rich and the poor as well as a lot of wealth. So why might that make, so the Secret Service report didn't mention any of that. It said, you know, it's, it's a few bad apples here and there. Um, but I think the rot is much broader. So think about how inequality affects you. We live in, a, in, in Puget Sound where uh, there's some very, very wealthy people. And does that, does that impact you? How do you think about that? Any thoughts? Do you think it causes you stress? Well, it raises market value. They contain more for things. They contain? They contain more for things. And so how is the real estate? Okay, so Seattle's a very expensive place. When, when I first came here, <laughs> you could buy a house for twenty-five, thirty thousand. 30000 Please. Wealth buys power and influence. So wealth buys influence. Yes, I, uh, I fall back on, and what kind of influence? We live in a democracy, right? So uh, one could say we have the best democracy money can buy. That was the title of Greg Pallas' book, and uh, uh, perhaps a refinement of it now would be we have the best democracy that, we have the best oligarchy that money can buy. Please. So if uh, the rich have all this wealth, and by the way, there's um, a study that just came out looking by uh, um, Gabriel Zuckman and another author uh, that looked at how corporations are hiding their wealth um, <clears throat> compared to what they were doing 20 or 30 years ago. And just a huge difference in that. And I think what's really interesting is that people are, just so you're not distracted, um, <laughs> people are now realizing that that's not good for us. So a lot of Americans would like to tax the rich. And even uh, President Biden in his State of the Union said he, was, he wanted to do that. And uh, there is some, uh, you know, he, what's the chance of that happening? I, uh, lady in the front row shakes her head, no. How, how, how could that happen? Well, we have some elected officials in Congress who would like that to happen. Yep. And it's a matter of um, them getting enough political capital or momentum to get that pushed through. Now, I don't know what the probability is, but um, the Senator Elizabeth Warren. Warren comes to mind. She's um, been very forthright about that. So, ma'am, those there's a few people now who are talking about taxing uh, taxing the rich and Elizabeth Warren you mentioned please at, at the state level the state supreme court is considering whether the capital gains tax is constitutional or not and meanwhile it's going into effect and also uh, there is a bill to uh, uh, enact a wealth tax which would 
So we have a few. So uh, the, the state Supreme Court is looking at whether a wealth tax could work, and there's some legislation. Capital gains tax would work, and there's some legislation to that effect. So rather than getting uh, down this uh, uh, rabbit hole, um, which you know I I want to present some of the ideas in the book, and so I coined a term about twenty some odd years ago, the Health Olympics. Suppose health were an Olympic event, and the race was how long you lived, life expectancy, and. You know, since the Olympic Games began in uh, 1922, the United States has racked up the most medals. Uh, often in the Summer Games, it wins the most gold and other medals. And uh, in the winter, sometimes we're number two or three. Suppose health was an Olympic event and the race was how long you lived, life expectancy. And just to set the, the stage here, we spend essentially half of the world's health care bill, about uh, $4.2 trillion in 2021, which represents a sixth of our total economy. So we spend a lot of money on health care. How many would give us the gold medal, the longest lived country? Top five. Six to 10. 11 to 15. One. 16 to 20. 21 to 25, uh, one, a few, 21 to 25, 26 to 30. Anybody put us below 30? All right, you win. So these are the, so I use the same data source since the 1990s, the United Nations Human Development Report. And these are the top 44 countries ranked by life expectancy in 2021. And they are only UN countries. Taiwan is not there, and there's some small populations and so on. These are the best data that I can find. You can go to our Central Intelligence Agency World Ranking site, puts us down farther. You can go to the World Bank, World Health Organization, because they recognize other countries. So we're 44th. So that's kind of interesting where there, there are 43 UN countries with longer lives than we have. What does that mean? If you look at the, uh, the differences, we're about eight years behind the longest lived country, which is? You can read it, good. So how many have been to Japan? Why are they so healthy? Mason? They eat a lot of fish. They eat a lot of fish. And they get along with each other. So before COVID, uh, and, and, and that's a very important thing, did you ever see a lone Japanese tourist? <laughs> you laughed. Did you ever see? So they don't do things alone. They do things together. It's called WA or social harmony. Do you ever see a lone American tourist? All the time. Now, remember we're eight years behind. Is that another eight years drooling in a nursing home? What does that really mean? You know, maybe I don't want to live eight more years uh, uh, incontinent and everything else. Well, what, are, what is our leading disease killer? Heart disease. Heart disease. Uh, it'll kill roughly half of us if present trends continue. What's number two? Cancer. Cancer. What's number three at least until 2021, COVID. Suppose we eliminated COVID, cancer, and heart disease as a cause of death. Where would we be? Would be would be would we beat Japan? No, but we'd be close. We'd be close. So the poor health status that all of us have in this country is equivalent to such a huge difference. Now, you will find reported in the media that our life expectancy has done this or that. Uh, and they even mention sometimes the years in difference, but they never report what the significance of that period of time translates into something we can measure. Um, so 
one tip. So why is Japan so much healthier? You, they eat a lot of fish and they and they do things together. How about other personal behaviors? Let me ask the question. Out of all the countries on this list, which country has the lowest proportion of men smoking? Not Japan. That's right, not Japan. Japan has a so it's the answer is the United States and Sweden. Uh, we have about 15% of people smoking in this country, and Japan's number uh, is three times higher. For men. For women, they don't smoke that much, except it'll surprise you to learn when they do smoke, and I, they smoke when they're pregnant. I mean, Japan breaks all the rules that we can think of uh, that produce health. And so the question becomes, how can we arrange a situ a, our society to be like Japan's and so we can break the rules and, uh, and, and light up or whatever else we want to do? That's the issue. So back in the 1950s, we were somewhere in the top five. That is, our life expectancy was one of the highest in the world. And back then, what was our inequality like? didn't have very much inequality back then. Bosses made about 10 times what an entry level or average worker made. Now it's 500 times or more. So inequality has soared. A lot of it is, has been pandemic profiteering. I mean, the corporations uh, have been just uh, making it to offshore tax havens over this period of time. So personal behaviors do not account for this difference. Medical care can't account for it because we spend so much and, uh, and can't show much for it. Without committing PowerPoint malpractice, I'll show you a few more images. This is 2019 to 2021 life expectancy, same measure, uh, with all the other rich countries there number of them saw declines from 2019 to 2020, and, uh, but they pretty well did not decline so much as we did. So as you know, we have about 1.1 million deaths from COVID so far. Well, actually, the number is higher than that. Um, so we haven't done so well. And, and we, should, well, we should be ashamed of this. But nobody knows it. That's the problem. So um, any idea what our, who our healthiest state is? Utah. Well, no. Uh, it's a state where my daughter is right now, Hawaii. Hawaii produced a report in, uh, on, uh, by the Department of Health. So this is a report from the Department of Health in 2012. Uh, and this is on page two of the report. It's about health in Hawaii. And this is a mountainside, which is a common um, reference point in Hawaii. And uh, I want to explore this because this is what they present to their citizens as illustrative of health in Hawaii. So let's look down at the bottom, downstream. And what's downstream? Well, all the chronic diseases that uh, you will suffer from as you get older, uh, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, cancer, and so on. So the Department of Health in Hawaii situates these far downstream. On the shore, just above that, are the behaviors that we're all told, told to improve. You know, smoking and obesity, physical inactivity. What's on the other side of the river? Health care. Somehow, Hawaii puts health care far downstream. What's above that? Well, it's what are now called by, in public health circles, the social determinants of health. Poverty, uh, education, uh, racism, uh, and pollution, and so on. So those are really, really important, and that's what we have come to see as, as uh, needing attention if we're going to get somewhere. But that's only at the waterfall. What's above that? 
socioeconomic conditions, and above that, the highest, that, you know, the root cause, political context and governance. So somehow, our longest lived state recognizes that polit political issues are the most important determinant of health. That's pretty impressive. But if I was to ask most Americans if, you know, what, what they would think about that, I think most people wouldn't think that our health is a political construct. It all depends on seeing your doctor and, and doing the right behaviors. So what about, sorry, uh, okay. So how about health care? So this is a graph of life expectancy trends from 1995 to 2015 on the horizontal axis in purchasing power parity dollars. It means the dollar buys the same amount. And on the vertical axis is life expectancy. And I've highlighted the United States. So by 2015, it hasn't even reached where Japan was in life expectancy in 1995. So this is basically a, an argument for saying that uh, we're not doing very well when we compare ourselves uh, to other countries. So inequality kills us all, and that's the key message. Inequality is bad for us. Think of it as a highly toxic, odorless, colorless, invisible gas that kills us from all the usual conditions we die of, and we're totally unaware of it. So. Beginning in 1979, there are about 500 studies linking inequality to various measures of health by different investigators on different populations uh, and different indicators, and they pretty well, they're pretty well all consistent. So in, 19, in 2008, a book came out, The Spirit Level, uh, about these factors, and what they did in their wisdom was aggregate a whole bunch of social conditions along with health conditions. You can read them on, a, on the vertical axis and multiplied z-scores, that's a statistical term. So you had a unitless measure of the health and social functions and on the horizontal measure was income inequality. And their brilliance was to remove the units. As soon as you put a lot of numbers in there, people's eyes gloss over and they don't pay much attention. And we, of course, have the worst outcomes for life expectancy, uh, infant mortality, teen births, trust, obesity, mental illness, uh, and so on. So that's consistent with everything else. We don't do that well. So that's the... So I, I came across these studies in uh, 1993 and 4, and I began monitoring them. As I said, I, I, got, I got to know the people that were doing them. Uh, so I spent some time at, uh, with Ichiro Kawachi at Harvard. I said I spent a month with Richard Wilkinson in Nepal to try and sense, should I believe this stuff? Are the people who are doing these, this kind of research, are they reputable, and so on? And I came to uh, realize, yes, this is worth uh, really pushing this idea. And then about 1997 or 98, I invited somebody from uh, University of British Columbia to come down here and do what we called then a public health grand rounds. And Clyde Hertzman um, came and, uh, and he basically introduced me to the ideas of early life, of David Barker. And, and so um, what Clyde's research and others have shown is that for all of us sitting in this room, roughly half of our health has been programmed by the time we're blowing out two, bir two candles on our second birthday cake. So a student of mine presented an Ignite talk at Town Hall on these ideas, and she produced this graphic, which I think is really illustrative of everything. You know, you start with conception, and then you, uh, if you deliver at term, you have nine months in, in, 
in utero, and by the time you're blowing out two candles on your second birthday cake, roughly half of your health as an adult has been programmed. How can that make sense? Well, think about it. You, um, you start life in the womb, and we know that your mother is exposed to all sorts of stressors, um, be they pollution or um, worried about uh, being uh, uh, abused or what have you. Uh, and those signals go to the fetus. And the fetus is sort of monitoring the outside world. I, some people call this the womb with a view hypothesis. Namely, they're getting information from the outside world to program their physiology to do what we're here to do, which is to survive to reproduce. If we don't survive to reproduce, we go the way of the dodo or the, or the passenger pigeon, and the species die out. From an evolutionary perspective, that's our purpose. So in early life, in, in utero and for the next couple of years afterwards, we adapt our physiology if, through epigenetic mechanisms, if you studied some biology, to uh, uh, survive, to reproduce, and, and pay the price. So two ideas. Inequality is really bad for you, and early life is when it matters most. I could uh, go into those ideas as well. i got to make sure I, I end on time, so... Uh, Yep, I'm going to keep going. Well, let's uh, dissect what's happening in the United States. So the next, this is an image of U.S. county life expectancy in 2019. And the dark blue is the longest lived counties, and the reds are the shortest lived counties. And you can see a more than a 20 year difference in life expectancy between the shortest and the longest lived. Reds are worse off, blues are much healthier. Where's the greatest concentration of reds, of poor health? In the red states. In the red states, very important point, yes. Mississippi Valley and Appalachia. Where's the, uh, where's, what, high, what blue highlights jump out to you? Colorado, Summit County, where, where the billionaires live, Aspen, places like that. And what's north? There's some red north of that. What's there? Indian reservations. Pine Ridge in South Dakota has the shortest lifespan of any place in the United States. So that's not good. Now, this is 2019. Remember I showed you our health has been declining compared to other countries and making absolute health declines. And I don't have a map for 2021 that hasn't appeared yet. Our Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation uh, in the uh, Hans Rosling building <laughs> across the street, uh, they will produce it probably sometime in the next year or so. I want to show you a map for 2014 next to it. So the map on the right is 2014, and the one on the left is 2019. Notice how the red has increased and the blues have gone down. So that's a sign of our declining health status. We're not living the long, healthy lives that I hope you would like to and, uh, and the rest of us would like to as well. So I think this, as inequality increases, we can see it at the county level, and our health has been declining over that period of time. So one thing I haven't mentioned, I haven't talked about yet. Remember the Mississippi Valley and the Southeast. Uh, uh, racism is a very important factor to determining health outcomes. And so, so this is getting some media attention. And in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago was a whole page devoted to childbirth is deadlier for black families even when they're rich, studies find. You know, we always sort of think the, 
you know, the American dream, uh, get rich and everything will be fine. Uh, and the other way, instead of getting rich, uh, we don't tell people to go out and get rich. We tell people to get educated, right? S graduate from college. So what do you think happens? Let's take a measure, deaths of women in childbirth, since that was one of the features there. By the way, they pointed out that they made comparisons where, with Sweden where uh, that wasn't true. Richer people did not have uh, better outcomes than poorer people the way they do here. So that's, we, we have to understand what's happening there. So something that has made the, the uh, media is black maternal mortality. Formerly enslaved women have high rates of death or serious complications, including some famous stars, tennis star and, and others. So what's going on with these people? Well, this is a graph of maternal mortality by race and education. And the red are black deaths of, uh, of women from maternal causes, and the education is in the th four columns uh, from left to right. The one on the right is a college graduate, and the one on the left is less than high school. And the red is the amount of maternal deaths. And notice, even a college-graduated African-American woman has a higher rate of maternal deaths than any other group of any racialized category here. So racism has a huge effect. And that's getting more attention today, but uh, uh, how, how we're going to sort of deal with it since, it, since just telling people to stay in school is not going to work. So this is still a, an important issue. So remember the state life, the county life expectancies. We can aggregate them by state. By the way, all, so all this stuff is sort of in the book, uh, and I could go and read parts of the book, but let me show you. Uh, we can take state life expectancies from 1958 to 2017 and look at life expectancy on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. And we can separate the states into those that are up high in the brown, that which includes Hawaii, and the ones in the bottom, uh, which includes a lot of the states that weren't doing so well. And then they are, the states that aren't doing so well have conservative state policy. So we're looking at the political policies in, in the state that we're discussing. And, uh, and so, you know, the federalism is the idea that any policy that is not specified in the Constitution devolves to the states, and so there are a lot of things that they do. So without going into the details of the kinds of state policies, uh, here they are, uh, abortion, criminal justice, uh, taxes, voting, marijuana. Those are the kind of policies that produce this kind of distinction. Okay, so what are we going to do about it? So I have some of my students here, and, uh, and they, what they have to do is create a situation where they present the ideas that you've been hearing to other people. And I used to have them, uh, before COVID, uh, plan and schedule a face-to-face -face event like this. And sometimes they'd get 10, 15 people out, which was a good turnout. Now they're doing it on social media and they can reach thousands. I haven't read the reports yet, uh, um, but for this class, the class will be over on, uh, at the end of this week. But there's a tremendous ability to reach out to many people, but you've got to counter the disinformation, the misinformation, all of these other factors that uh, make it more difficult. But, you know, the possibility is really, really there. 
I haven't read anything from the book. And I have, uh, what should we do? Should we have questions uh, now, or shall, we, uh, shall I read a passage or two from the book? What are your thoughts? Do a passage. A reading or two. Uh, reading or two, okay. Um, well, how do you know something is true? I've been presenting a lot of stuff here, you know. I, um, any reason you should believe me? How do you know something is true? You're not a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> okay, That's, uh, that works for this audience. Anybody else, please? You prove things. Yes, I, I used to be a mathematician, and I did proofs. Um, how are you going to prove what I presented? Here's our data. 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 I mean, okay, so um, how are you going to prove that we are dead first? All you need to do that is to... You know, when you die, and when you died in my emergency department, I filled out a death certificate. That was linked to the birth certificate, so we got mortality rates, and then you could aggregate those and come up with life expectancy or maternal mortality or, or any of those uh, indicators. So I once asked this question in a grade 8 class where some private school here in Seattle where some very rich people uh, sent their kids. So let me read. The process of getting you to consider changing your deeply held beliefs is challenging. How do you co come to know something is true? I asked this question when speaking to a variety of different audiences. I was once giving a talk in a grade 8 class in a private school near Seattle where some of the richest people in the world send their children. I was talking about how healthy we in the United States were and the reasons why. Students looked bewildered and were not allowed to distract themselves with their devices. I stopped and asked, how do you know something is true? Nobody answered. Uncomfortable silence followed. Rather than break the silence by saying something, I remained mute. Finally, one boy raised his hand and said, if our parents tell us when we're very young, if our teachers and friends reinforce that idea, and if we've ex experienced it, then we know it to be true. Early life exposure, reinforcement by, uh, by people that you respect and experience. This is the best, you know, that's epistemology, uh, the philosophy of how you know something is true. How do you experience these mortality rates? That's the tough part. And you have to sort of trust the data and you have to know how to sort of interrogate it. So I haven't talked much about poverty, um, but one of the people that I connected with that, whose ideas were really respectful, who put a blurb on the back of the book, Robert Sapolsky, uh, a neuroscientist, uh, he was talking about poverty and he said, in many ways, it was one of the great stupid moves of all times. Hunter-gatherers have thousands of wild sources of food to subsist on. Agriculture changed all that, generating an overwhelming reliance on a few dozen domesticated food sources, making you extremely vulnerable to the next famine, the next locust infestation, the next potato blight. Agriculture allowed for the stockpiling of resources, of surplus resources, and thus, inevitably, the unequal stockpiling of them, stratification of society, and the invention of classes. Thus, it allowed for the invention of poverty. I think that the punchline of the primate human difference is when humans invented poverty, they came up with a way of subjugating the low ranking like nothing ever before seen in the poverty world. 
poverty is an invention. Robert Reich uh, is very explicit. He says, poverty is a policy choice. And we have the most poverty of all, re of all rich countries, and that perhaps is a policy choice that we've made. Questions at any time? Um, please. My impression is that even if people know these statistics and kind everything, of they're fine with it. They're, they're okay. It does not bother them. Okay, I mean, okay, so it comes, if, they, if they know this, it just doesn't bother them. What would you rather do? Live a longer life or a shorter one? If you'd rather live a shorter life, well, you're rewarded for living in this country. Think of the people that didn't even reach age 60. I sometimes show mortality rates for 15-year-olds to reach age 60, and, and the results are shocking compared to other countries. 15-year-old girl in Sri Lanka has a better chance of being alive at age 60 than a 15-year-old American girl, and so on. So. Can you name some people that, that didn't reach age 60 that were notables? Elvis, Steve Jobs, Michael Jackson. You know, so we don't live that long. And another way is, uh, of, of asking the question, if we had, if our length of life was so good, and maybe we don't want to live long lives, but if our length of life was so good, at any one point in time, surely the oldest old person must live in the United States. That's never the case. Even the rich, the really rich people don't live to be that old. And you know, studies show that as well. Where are the oldest old most of the time? In Japan. Yeah, in Japan. Please. So what's the effect of immigration in all of this? Of? <laughs> immigration. The countries with the longer lifespans have limited immigration compared to us. Celebration or celebration? Immigration. Immigration. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm partially deaf. So it's true. Japan doesn't have a lot of immigrants, although as the policy is aging, they're changing that. Suppose we take immigration to the United States. What are the proportion of people that live in the United States that weren't born here? The figure is about 13%. It's about the same in Sweden. Most Swedish immigrants come from the Middle East. And they're Arab descent or Arabs, and yet they do better and Yes, there are some issues with immigration in Sweden, but uh, the country with the highest proportion of immigrants, according to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, is the country of my birth, Canada. 20% of people living in Canada were born outside of Canada. In the town I grew up in, Toronto, 85% of high school students speak English as a second language. The tolerance of immigrants in Canada, according to surveys, is very, very high. What happens to immigrants when they come to the United States? Well, there's some interesting studies of Africans coming to the United States, and they look at the infant mortality and birth weight of these African immigrants, and they're much higher than they are for the African Americans. They haven't experience the racism because they've immigrated here. They haven't experienced the racism over that long period of time. So immigration is a, I, I think I took, it, it is a, an important factor. I, I, I'm sure I took a health hit by moving here from Canada. <laughs> Other comments, questions? Please. Sorry. Uh, recorded, so. Right. Okay. Um, 
the the data is shocking. Uh, I I knew some of this before coming here, and I don't disagree with anything that's been presented. My biggest question is, how do we change this? Because obviously it's going, it's getting worse all the time, yep. according to the graphs. And and I, other than trying to elect uh, people that I think are going to try and change things for the better, I have no idea what to do. So the power of the people in power is much less than the power of the rest of us. And the people in power are afraid of people power. So, you know, there's the African proverb, if you want to go uh, far, <laughs> go alone. If you, want, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So in a sense, we have to organize or die. We have to work together. We have to find some way of being like the Japanese and have social harmony and work together. At the same time, we have a system, uh, I, I learned a new word last night, limbic capitalism. You know, we have a capitalist economy and uh, the limbic system is the one that gives you pleasure and pain and the core of your brain. And capitalism is feeding our limbic system without uh, having us organize, uh, we seek individual pleasures rather than working together. The, the last part of my book is a poem from uh, Marge Piercy, The Low Road. Let's see. I might as well read it. And this, so chapter 10 is all about the various things to do in the book. What can they do to you? Whatever they want. They can set you up. They can bust you. They can break your fingers. They can burn your brain with electricity. Blur you with drugs till you can't walk, can't remember. They can take your child, wall up your lover. They can do anything you can't stop them from doing. How do you stop them? Alone you can fight, you can refuse, you can take whatever revenge you can, but they roll over you. Two people can keep each other sane, can give support, conviction, love, massage, hope, sex. Three people are a delegation, a wedge. With four, you can play bridge and start an organization. With six, you can rent a whole house and eat pie for dinner with no seconds and hold a fundraising party. A dozen make a demonstration. A hundred fill a hall. 10,000, a thousand have solidarity in your own newsletter. 10,000 power in your own paper. A hundred thousand your own media. 10 million your own country. It starts on one at a time. It starts when you Care to act. It starts when you do it again after they said no. It starts when you say we and know who you mean and each day you mean one more. So I want to put in a plug for Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. Uh, this is a physician started organization. It has been involved in two uh, Nobel Prizes, WPSR.org, and we have uh, three branches. One is nuclear weapons, the other is uh, the climate crisis, and the third is uh, economic inequality. And we have a, uh, we have a staff and we have uh, regular meetings on the Economic Inequity Health Task Force. If you go to the website, WPSR.org, you can sign up and receive newsletters, get involved to the extent you can. And most members are not physicians. In other words, uh, they're, they're, they range over a real variety of, of the people, most of them in Washington State. So that's an organization to join and get involved with. Please. Is the organization at all involved with um, issues related to gun control? Uh, issues related to gun control? 
issues related to gun control? Not exactly, no. No. Um, so the, the whole gun control issue is fascinating. Homicides are linked to income inequality. More unequal parts of the country have uh, more homicides. I've already talked about mass shootings. There are more of those. I mean, inequality, which is patterned by political choices we make, as the Department of Health in Hawaii suggests, is really the upstream factor along with uh, the early life issues. Remember, as you go from the erection to the resurrection, it's the first thousand days after conception when roughly half of your health as adults is programmed. <laughs> Notice, so I spend a lot of time creating one-liners. I try them out. A good way to try them, I mean, Create your own. A good way to try them out is around supper time when you get a marketing call that's being recorded for quality assurance purposes. I have my students practice their elevator speeches on the phone then because they won't hang up because it's being recorded. So craft one-liners because people may not remember a lot of what you said, but they might remember the one-liner. You know, we're dead first, inequality kills, uh, and so on. How are we doing? Am I? Uh... Well, we're pretty close on time. I'd like to ask if there's any other questions before we wrap up this evening. My, oh, my email is, uh, gosh, it's not there. Uh, S-A-B-E-Z at U-W dot E-D-U. S-A-B-E-Z at U-W dot E-D-U. I get emails from people I'm well I, and I haven't seen for a long time and uh, that's a good way to get in touch I I learned from Noam Chomsky always answer meaningful emails or letters I I wrote him back in the 1990s and he replied with a letter and so I've been you know I, I've been learning from all the people that uh, have good ideas well thank you all for coming really it's been a pleasure and take, take these ideas and make them your own. <laughs>